This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Brilliant is a fun and interactive way to learn math, physics, computer science, and more every single day. They have thousands of lessons for anybody at any stage of their educational adventure, and new exclusive lessons are added every single month. They even have everyday mathematics and introductory algebra courses for people to learn the pillars of mathematical thinking, which is so important because that is a massive barrier for so many people who want to get into STEM. Brilliant is as fun as it is challenging, so you master science skills instead of just memorizing them. And the best part is, not only can you try their app for free, but they're offering the first 200 of my subscribers who go to brilliant.org slash borisfalkai 20% off an annual premium subscription. If you want to learn more, and not just about this offer, but like literally learn more, then make 2023 the year that you maximize your mind and go to brilliant.org slash borisfalkai. Remember, you can get started for free and the first 200 people get 20% off their subscription for the whole year. Keep exploring and become brilliant! What exactly is a human? This question might seem pretty simple at first, but really think about it. Try to come up with a couple of things that we do that other animals don't do. Things that we have that other animals don't have. What makes us special and distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom? The more you think about this question, the more you may start to realize that it's a little bit more complicated than you originally expect. So first and foremost, we should probably start with the same thing that we do with any other living thing, classification. And for that, we're going to talk to my friend Erica. Well, thank you, Forrest. Now, most people today understand that we humans are, of course, eukaryotes, animals, chordates, and mammals. After all, we have nucleated cells enveloped in a cellular membrane. We begin life as a blastula. We have both a notochord and a nerve cord, and we are absolutely covered with hair with nipples to boot. But here humans join another very exclusive club at the level of order along our nested hierarchy, that of primates. The primate order includes lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, all brands of monkeys, and apes. And primates have a really cool set of features that separate us from the other mammals. Our nimble and dexterous hands are capped with nails instead of claws, and we use them to procure a wide variety of resources. Leaves, fruit, gums, nectar, insects, and meat. We have binocular vision, which means that we use our two eyes to gain exceptional depth perception. In fact, we invest so heavily in sight that it comes at the expense of our sense of smell, which is diminished in all primates. And most primates can also see in color, which is pretty weird amongst the mammals. We live in a broad range of habitats, but we're all really good at maneuvering through trees, thanks to our flexible body and mobile limbs. And we also invest heavily into our young, typically only giving birth to one or two at a time. And this is necessary because we take a really long time to grow up and learn how to navigate the complicated environments and social systems which we inhabit. Humans are also a very special type of primate, a haplorine primate. We have further decreased our reliance on smell, decreasing the size of our olfactory bulbs and our nose scrolls, turbinates, as well as getting rid of the renarium entirely. Our vision is absolutely superb in most people, up close and far away, and we further honed our ability to distinguish between minute colors. As a result, most primates are diurnal. That means we come out during the day when colors can actually be readily distinguished between, and we've also lost a structure in the eye called the tapetum lucidum. This is what gives most mammals that eye shine in the dark and also gives them wonderful night vision. We've closed off our orbits more using post-orbital plates instead of post-orbital bars, and we've also fused a bunch more bones in the skull, including the frontal and the mandible. Haplorine primates also have but a single pair of nipples and a unicornuate uterus. We humans are also a special type of haplorine as well. We are a catarine haplorine. Don't panic, I know that's a mouthful, but really all it means is that we are old world monkeys as opposed to new world monkeys. The most striking characteristics of our infraorder, Caterini, is the fact that we have downward facing nostrils instead of nostrils to the side like the platerines have, and we have a 2-1-2-3 dental formula. 
This means in each quadrant of the mouth, we have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. Did you hear that word infraorder? If we look super closely at the taxonomic hierarchy, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, there are little subdivisions between the major groups. So let's go one more small step down before we get to family and talk about our super family. Our super family is called hominoidia, which means we are apes. But we're not gibbons, so we don't get grouped in with the lesser apes. We are in the family hominidae, the great apes. Although I still think that there should be another classification for just okay apes. Apes have super mobile shoulders and wrists. We also have big broad chests and stiff short lower backs. Apes also have a more orthograde or upright posture compared to the old world monkeys. Plus a unique appendix, a small incisive foramina, a deeply arched palate, and larger brains than you would expect for our body size. Here's where things get interesting though, because apes, of course, are different in their morphology from other primates, yes, but we're also different behaviorally. We apes are tool users. Now, I hear you screaming at your computer at home, but what about the capuchins? Capuchin monkeys are platyrines, and they use tools to crack open nuts. They're not apes, and yet they are tool users. And to that I say, true, but capuchins don't have the same broad toolbox that we tend to see in apes. A great many apes have tool kits, a wide variety of tools that they use to accomplish different tasks depending on the problem they're faced with. And critically, and perhaps most interestingly, these toolkits differ depending on the community of apes that you're looking at. Sometimes the differences are arbitrary, and sometimes not. The large brains that apes have certainly allows us to innovate in these wild ways, but a brain of that size needs to be taught. And it's for this reason that apes grow up slowly. We stay with our mothers for years, and drastically different from what we see in most other mammals. Orangutan babies stay with their mothers for seven years and human cultures do so for even longer. And this is because we need to be able to grow up and figure out how to navigate our environment in the safety of an experienced mother. And not just physically, also socially. Moms teach us how to make tools, yes, but they also teach us how to socialize with one another. But even though primates are unique amongst the mammals and apes are unique amongst the primates, humans are unique amongst the apes. Let's talk about why. Hominins are members of the hominini tribe, another subcategory between family and genus. And just like with any other classification, that means that hominins have their own special group of unique adaptations. Today, humans are the only hominins left in existence, but this group of characteristics can be found in every single hominin species for the past 7 million years. We have significantly reduced canines compared to the other great apes, and we don't have a diastema, or a little gap between our teeth for that canine tooth to fit into when our mouths are closed. On the one hand, this means that we lack the big imposing canines that other great apes have, but this is actually a good thing for us, because smaller canines gives us an advantage called non-honing chewing, which means we're able to move our jaws around, which increases the range of our diets and helps a lot with speaking. And speaking is another thing that is evidently unique to hominins. We need to contextualize this, however, because loads of other primates have very complicated vocalization and communication systems. For example, vervet monkeys and Campbell's monkeys both utilize syntax in the way that we humans utilize it in our own languages. They have alarm calls that can be altered with a second alarm call. So one might mean predator, and then a second might mean from above, which means it's an eagle. Another might mean from below, which means it's a leopard. Chimpanzees have the language basics down as well, with 90% of their gestural repertoire matching those that we see in human toddlers. And finally, geladas, which are considered by most primatologists to be one of the dumber primates to study, have vocalization systems that map with human language laws, including Zips and Menzeraths law. But no other animal even comes close to humans when it comes to speaking. Our ancestors developed the ability to speak over the past two million years, and this was made possible largely by the position of our hyoid bone, which anchors the tongue and allows for very complex vocalizations, which can convey very complex ideas. So now, rather than just saying things like, there's a predator over there, we can say things like, I never said she stole my money. Think about all the ways that we can very slightly tweak that sentence and dramatically change its meaning. 
I never said she stole my money. 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 Those are all very different sentences with the same words. As we develop speech, we also continue to develop absurdly large brains, gaining neural mass most notably in areas of the brain associated with executive function. This aided not only in our communication, but also in our ability to think critically, to innovate, to plan for the future, to think symbolically, and to cultivate our own potential. Other apes have these brain regions as well, but in hominins specifically, they are absolutely maxed out. As far as brain size is concerned, we don't have the largest brains in the animal kingdom, but when we compare our brain size to our body size, we are definitely a big step outside the norm. Speaking of step, Hominins are the only apes that are consistently terrestrially bipedal. This simply means we walk upright on our two feet on the ground. And this is because of a large suite of minute morphologic changes that occurred through time. Our entire skeleton is adapted for how we move around. This includes the nature of our pelvis. We have sagittally oriented iliac plates that gives our pelvis a bowl shape. We have an anterior frame and magnum, that's the hole at the base of the skull, which is shunted forward in order for our spine to come out directly below the skull. We have a valgus knee, which allows us to carry our weight directly underneath our body as we move around. We also have three arches in our feet and an inline helix or big toe, which allows us to transfer weight efficiently through our foot as we stride across the landscape. Hominins also have lumbar lordosis, that nice S shape in our spine that allows us to stand upright as we survey the world around us and keep our body in sort of a single column. There's numerous other minutia that goes into the suite of skeletal characteristics that allow us to be bipedal, but an important thing to note here is that these characteristics didn't appear all at once. In fact, they first emerged in small numbers seven million years ago with Sahelanthropus chidensis, a hominin who's just beginning to have a more anterior frame and magnum. That hole at the base of the skull is just beginning to look more tucked up underneath. Artipithecus ramidus comes next with a more anterior frame and magnum, sure, but also seemingly a semi-valgus knee and the beginnings of a bull-shaped pelvis that looks more familiar. By Australopithecus, around three to four million years ago, we're looking at a fully bipedal hominin. A hominin that, from the waist down, would have looked just like us. Not walking on all fours freed up our hands to do a lot of cool stuff. More than any other ape, hominins rely on material culture, or tools that we create to help us survive in our environments. As Erica mentioned before, lots of other apes make tools, but the tools that hominins make are far more complex and usually made by breaking and shaping stone. The very earliest evidence of stone tools goes back 3.3 million years ago to a site called Lamequi. But think about all the other things that you could potentially make a tool out of. Things like bones and sticks and moss. Things that other ape species make tools out of today. Things that don't preserve nearly as well as a rock would. So it's very likely that our ancestors made a wide variety of tools out of lots and lots of different materials, but only the stone tools stuck around for us to learn about today. But whenever we started making tools and whatever they were made of, we know for sure that by 2.6 million years ago, we were onto something really special with our stone tool production. And that marks the beginning of the genus Homo. And just so you know, anything in the genus Homo can be called a human. Does that give you a clue as to why the question, what is a human, gets harder to answer when we look back through time? There have been several species of humans. As our toolkit advanced, so did our potential niche. We began to have access to a broader range of resources which we could then exploit, including things like killing larger game, having access to that marrow, those bones, that hide. And our toolkit's advancement probably also included the ability to transport water with us in things like rudimentary water skins. This would have allowed ancient humans to cut the umbilical cord with stationary bodies of water, freeing us up to effectively travel across the entire world. This increased access to better resources fueled the development of bigger brains, which allowed us to make better tools, which gave us access to better resources, which fueled the development of bigger brains, which allowed us to make better tools, which gave us access to better resources, which fueled the development of bigger brains. 
Humans and tools evolved together, hand in literal hand. We made our tools, and our tools made us in return. Being clever in our material culture likely also influenced our social system, giving a fitness advantage to the tool-making expert, yes, but also the liar, the romantic, the comedian, the schmoozer, the protector, and the leader. All sorts of different social strategies fueled by a strong theory of mind and large group sizes likely created a new feedback loop for increased skills in social competence and relationship management. These are all skills that are related to the frontal lobe, which is an area that is particularly large in one hominin above all else, and that's Homo sapiens, our species, which perhaps has something to do with why we are the only remaining hominin today. Something to think about. Going back around 800,000 years ago, one of our ancestors, called Homo erectus, started to control fire and cook their food, making it more nutritious and easier to digest. The increase in protein led to an increase in body size, while the increase in food quality and decrease in the reliance of our teeth as tools led to smaller teeth and jaws. Fire also opened up access to new environments, like the frozen north. Hominin species like the Neanderthals and the Denisovans evolved in the icy steppes of Eurasia, and Homo erectus made it all the way to the islands of Indonesia, where they found another shorter hominin species called Homo floresiensis. Down in the southern tip of Africa, Homo naledi navigated narrow cave systems, seemingly to ceremonially bury their dead. And in East Africa, our species, Homo sapiens, stretched across the savanna. Genetic evidence shows that our species most likely found their first home in what is now Ethiopia. Eventually, for whatever reason, Homo sapiens left Africa, and where we went, other hominins disappeared. Some of them still live on in our genomes in different ways. For example, if you have Northern European ancestry in your family tree, you may have up to 5% Neanderthal in your genome. If you have ancestry from Southeast Asia, you may have up to 12% Denisovans in your genome. So what happened? Why are we the only ones left. Some people think that we simply subsumed all of the other hominins into our own species, breeding them out of existence. Others propose ancient warfare. We simply exterminated anything that looked like us but wasn't us when we came upon them. And others still propose that maybe it was simply chance. Maybe Homo sapiens was better equipped to handle the changing climate that loomed on the horizon than any other hominin. But whatever the reason, by 30,000 years ago, certainly, we were alone on planet Earth. While only Homo sapiens carries the torch of the hominin tribe today, the other human species that we shared the Earth with practiced many of the cultural innovations that we tend to associate only with ourselves. We all made tools of one kind or another. Some species made art and music, even jewelry and makeup. Morphologically or behaviorally, whatever separated us from the other humans was a very small difference that ended up making a very big difference over time. As soon as we were alone, things like agriculture and domesticated animals and science and writing all popped up practically overnight. Now at this point, it may seem like we've answered our original question, or at least gotten very close to it. A human is anything that fits into the genus Homo. But that actually isn't the whole story. You see, it's quite difficult to draw a definite line between our genus and the other great apes, both living and extinct. For example, Australopithecus afarensis had limb proportions that we've previously used to categorize and characterize members of genus Homo. They were also potentially the makers of those Lumecki stone tools from 3.3 to 3.4 million years ago. And considering that as far as we know today, non-stone tool use is rampant in the apes, there's simply no telling what other types of stone tools Australopiths were capable of utilizing. Now, unlike Ardipithecus before it, Australopithecus would have looked effectively human from the waist down to an untrained eye. It had all of the characteristics that a biped has, and of course humans are bipeds, so this thing would have been very familiar looking to us if you were just looking at the lower limbs and the pelvis. It also has some interesting characteristics with regard to the face that make it look a bit more familiar. It's less prognathic or snouty than chimps. It has a more human looking dental arcade beginning to get this arch in it. It's got smaller canine teeth and indeed 
The brain, although perhaps nothing to write home about compared to modern humans at 1200 cc's, it is still quite a bit bigger than chimpanzees, maxing out at around 550 cc's. Now, having a tiny pinhead brain case size may seem like a good enough reason to just not even consider Australopithecus afarensis as anywhere close to our mighty genus Homo. Well, let's consider some of the early members of our genus. The earliest is Homo habilis, being probably as old as 2.3 million years ago, but potentially even as old as 2.8 million years ago, depending on the dating of a certain mandible. And you'll notice that the brain case is like pretty small. The range for this thing was 509 to 687 cc's, which is barely on the upper end getting to half the brain case size of humans. It's categorized as genus Homo in part because the face is substantially more modern looking than Australopithecus afarensis. After Homo habilis, we have Homo rudolfensis around 2 million years ago, which again, the, the face is pretty modern looking compared to Australopithecus afarensis, but the brain case size on this thing is 750 to 825 cc's, which is still substantially lower than modern humans. And yet, these two knuckleheads get to be in genus Homo, and Australopithecus doesn't, despite the fact that rudolfensis overlaps with habilis, and habilis overlaps with Australopithecus in overall brain case size. Now you might just say, screw it, count Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis as members of Australopithecus and start Homo with the real OG, Homo erectus. But the problem with this is that Homo erectus is also super variable. Remember, everything from Australopithecus onward is a biped and looks effectively human from the waist down and maybe even a little bit from the neck down. So we tend to categorize it by facial characteristics and brain case size. Now, the average for Homo erectus, depending on how you classify it, hovers around 900 to 1000 cc's, which is much closer to the human range. But then consider that we have Homo erectus specimens in Zuleto from Demenisi that have brain case sizes as little as like 546 cc's in the Australopith range. So it's kind of difficult to draw the line where Australopithecus ends and Homo begins, isn't it? Let me make it even more frustrating because just 50,000 years ago, we had a hominin living at the same time as Homo sapiens, our own species, definitely a member of genus Homo based off of all the physical characteristics, except for the brain case size, which was about 350 cc's because this was a dwarf hominin living on the island of Flores. Biology is messy, isn't it? This wide range of brain sizes, along with modern neurological research, suggests that it's the wiring of the brain, along with its overall size, that actually matters. And while that's very interesting, it makes classifying hominins based on brain size much more difficult, and perhaps even unreliable. Not to mention the fact that species like Australopithecus sediba, Homo ergaster, Homo rudolfensis, and even Homo habilis are so perfectly mosaic in their general morphology that how they're classified, or how they should be classified, is still debated to this day. The trouble is, trying to sort out the specifics of where everybody belongs on our family tree is more difficult now than it ever has been before, because of the simple fact that we just have too many fossils, and we're finding more all the time. So the line between where we begin and our ancestors end is getting blurrier by the day. And you might think that genetics would come to the rescue here, right? At least with modern species. But it actually makes things weirder. We share 96.4% of our DNA with orangutans, 97.7% with gorillas, and a whopping 98.8% with our closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. But now think about this. Willow warblers and chiffchaffs are birds that look almost identical to each other, but are definitely different species, and they share 97.7% .7 of their DNA with each other. That's as much as we share with gorillas. So good, humans and gorillas are definitely different species, fine. But that's significantly less than the 98.8 .8 that we share with chimpanzees and bonobos. In fact, chimps, bonobos, and us are more closely related to each other than any one of us are related to gorillas. So just like us, chimpanzees are primates, they are haplorines, they are catarines, they are hominoids, they are hominids. But should we consider them to be hominins, or should we push it even further and consider them, in our genus, genus Homo, considering they share 98.8% of our coding base pairs? Consider that lions and tigers share only around 95% of their coding base pairs, and yet they're both in genus Panthera. On the other hand, African and Asian elephants of genus Loxodonta and elephants share 95% of their coding base pairs, and as I just mentioned, they're in different genera. 
So how do we figure this out? Even just asking these questions raises further questions. Taxonomy is a completely human endeavor. There are no labels out in nature. But does the way that we classify things only matter in a science book? Could changing the way that we group our relatives together change the way that we think about them? Or maybe even the way that we treat them? Really stop and consider it for a second. How would it change the way that you thought about the Australopithecines or the chimpanzees if there was a complete and unequivocal scientific consensus that they definitely were not, or definitely were, members of the genus Homo? That thought should rattle your brain a little bit. Now you may pause for a moment and think, well the answer certainly lies in another thing that humans have, our morality. We know right from wrong. But humans are not alone there either, because even though we call it proto-morality, it does in fact seem that other primates, and indeed other mammals, have rules that govern their behavior. And these behaviors can receive reward or punishment depending on how they impact other group members. We see them punish lying, carry out what humans would ostensibly consider revenge. They comfort hurting or mourning friends and family. They practice altruism and demand fairness, and they even manage conflict resolution. So I do think it can be argued very easily looking at the literature that other animals have morality. It's simply that humans have dialed it up to 11 yet again. This is just another difference of degree, but not one of kind. If we look closely here, there is one thing that Homo sapiens do that is very unique and very weird. We apply our morality and our empathy across time, space, and even reality itself. Chimpanzees feel bad for and even comfort each other, as do many other mammal species. But we can feel bad for people that we've never met. We can even feel bad for characters and stories that aren't even real. Watch this, I'll prove it to you. Mr. Rainbow's The Magic Space Dog hurt his paw. You felt that, didn't you? And lots of species of humans have been very compassionate for a very long time. There are several examples of hominin remains that bear injuries that would have been lethal without the help of their groupmates. This 1.8 million year old Homo erectus fossil from Demonisi, Georgia has no teeth, and the sockets are completely healed over, which means this person died years after their teeth fell out. This old man lived at a time when he couldn't just bop down to the corner store and pick up some applesauce. The only way he could have lived is if somebody else was caring for him and making sure he had soft, squishy things to eat. We also see multiple healed injuries that would have required a person to be off their feet for a very long time. Something that could only be survived if someone was bringing you food and probably even carrying you around. For example, Shanadar 1 is a Neanderthal who sustained a serious blow to the head that crushed and probably destroyed his left eye, as well as the part of the brain responsible for controlling the right half of the body. The bones of his right arm are withered from non-use, and there's evidence of loss of function in his right leg as well. He even had a fracture in one of the bones of his right foot, which probably would have added to his already noticeable limp. And yet, all of these broken bones were fully healed well before he died at a relatively old age for his species. This Neanderthal, this human, could not have survived in the wild without the care of his community. Okay, so what makes us human is a really complicated question with a really convoluted answer that doesn't seem to have any clear borders. When we're considering morphology, genetics, and behavior, Picking out where humans begin or end is about as difficult as picking out where red emerges on a color gradient. That is to say, it's pretty well impossible. But even if we can't define with any real certainty where our species starts and ends, perhaps we can point out a few things that, as gentle and modern humans we do today, that makes us unique. Overall, we humans are pretty weird. We manipulate our environments, we cultivate our food, we establish social order, and we fail at all of those things too. We eat almost everything, from roots, to leaves, to fungi, to meat. We explore and probe our surroundings. We find patterns where there aren't really patterns, meaning where there isn't really meaning, and hope where there wouldn't be hope otherwise. We take chances, we make mistakes, 
we get messy, we care for each other, and we teach each other, and we feel for each other, here and there, past and present, real and fiction. We are, without a doubt, the strangest apes to ever live. And personally, I wouldn't rather be anything else. So if you want to feel just a little bit more human today, plant a garden, grill a steak, and be kind to one another. Those are all, more or less, uniquely human things that make us special. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thanks so much to Erica for helping out with this video, and thanks so much to you for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop on your way out, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts, have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye! But no animal even comes close to humans when it comes to speaking. Our ancestors developed the ability to speak over the past two million years, and this was made possible largely by the position of our hyoid bone, which anchors the tongue and allows for very complex vocalizations, which can convey very long... Human speech. It's a marvelous adaptation.